The final guest video in this run is from Ali and Micah, a neuroscientist and a clinical therapist who run neurotransmissions. Their video has giant magnets, 3D printing, and a Star Wars action figure. Ali, Micah, it's all yours. We're here at the Keck Center at UC San Diego, and this is a functional magnetic resonance imager, or an fMRI. Well, functional, but not functioning. This is actually a dummy scanner that's used for educational and training purposes. An actual fMRI machine houses a three Tesla magnet that's more than 60,000 times more powerful than the Earth's magnetic field, and over 3,000 times more powerful than your average fridge magnet. If we were anywhere near the real deal, well, we would put our camera and our equipment at serious risk. But why on earth would anyone possibly need a magnet so powerful? Well, some of the researchers here at UCSD are using fMRI to study the human brain in ways that 30 years ago just weren't even possible. I'm Maggie. I'm a fourth year graduate student at UC San Diego. My name is Stephanie Nelly. I'm a sixth year PhD student in John Serence's lab. We study mostly selective attention and expectation and other cognitive factors and how they influence visual processing in humans. My research is about really basic visual perception. How do we make sense of the world around us? How do we choose out of the plethora of things that are constantly kind of accosting our, our visual system? How does your brain kind of make sense of the massive amount of information and constantly bombarding it. fMRI itself was developed not very long ago. It's a very new technique uh, as far as human research goes. And it was developed in the 90s, I believe, actually at Bell Labs. fMRI is a particular specialty of MRI um, called functional MRI. So what that does is basically, um, instead of measuring the difference between particular tissues, you're actually optimizing to detect the difference between oxygenated versus deoxygenated blood in a person's brain. For a long time, it was impossible to look at the brain up close without cracking open someone's skull. <laughs> And even if you got a brain from someone who's passed on, that's not all that useful for understanding how it works. When Leonardo da Vinci dissected the human brain in the 16th century, it was with the intention of finding the seat of the human soul. Spoiler alert, he didn't. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, the functions of different brain areas were essentially a mystery well after the scientific revolution. But fMRI changed all of that by giving scientists the ability to see the brain working in real time, track activities in different brain regions, and read your mind. No, unfortunately not for us scientists. An fMRI machine cannot read the mind. It can tell you basically where blood is being transported to in the brain, so which parts of the brain are active. An fMRI scan can tell you um, when someone is doing some cognitive task, what kind of patterns of brain activity you see. So which areas are active, what information are those areas representing? For instance, if you have someone look at different images and you measure MRI while they do that, then later if you have that same person come in and you say, okay, think about something. Now I can, based on that information, I can guess what you were thinking about. I could probably say you're looking to the left by looking at your neural activity. Or I could say you're looking at a horizontal line by looking at your neural activity. However, am I going to be able to tell what you're daydreaming about or who you're in love with or something like that? No, I don't think that's going to happen in, in my lifetime, but you know, set it on camera so we'll be able to... <laughs> it might not quite make sense how a magnet does all of this, so let's break down the process step by step. Let's say that Ray here has been having some neurologically linked problems and a doctor refers her for an fMRI. All of her force powers are messing with her head. Oh no, Kylo Ren keeps appearing in my mind. I can't stop thinking about his hot torso. Oh. <laughs> the technicians place her on the table, give her some earplugs, and stabilize her head so she can't move it at all. If the head moves during the scan, the images will come out fuzzy. Next, the table slides into this large donut-shaped section, which houses the ultra-powerful magnet. The strong magnetic field of this magnet then actually turns the hydrogen atoms in our blood. Wait, what? Yeah, the human body has a lot of hydrogen atoms because well, we're mostly made up of H2O. That's water. The magnetic field from the fMRI interacts with the protons in the hydrogen atoms and makes those protons essentially point in the same direction. That's right, your molecules are magnetic. <laughs> Hence, the magnetic resonance part of magnetic resonance imaging. Once Ray's in position, she'll hear a series of very loud clangs and beeps. <laughs> But 
these sounds aren't just the hottest new beat. <laughs> they actually serve a purpose. Every clang you hear is a radio wave pulse being fired off. This radio wave disrupts the uniform direction of the protons and pushes them in slightly different directions. Here's the cool part. As the protons move back into realignment, they release their very own small radio signal. And those signals are then detected by the fMRI machine's radio receiver, which starts taking snapshots of cross sections of your brain, which you hear as the beeping sound. After some complicated computation, what shows up on the computer screen is a series of images that show both the anatomy of your brain and highlighted areas where there's more blood flow. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. So fMRI doesn't actually measure your brain activity. It can't detect your individual neurons firing as cool as that would be. <laughs> fMRI machines actually detect what's called the BOLD signal. So the BOLD signal stands for blood oxygen level dependent signal, um, and it's basically an index of how much oxygenated hemoglobin is in a person's blood at a particular point in their brain. Neurons themselves don't keep a high you know, store of glucose hanging around so that they can do their job. And so the blood vessels through they, these things called astrocytes actually help supply neurons with the glucose and oxygen that they need to do their signaling. When you have neural activity that happens in your brain, a bunch of blood will rush to that area. And it turns out that oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin in your blood have different magnetic properties. So deoxygenated hemoglobin will kind of disrupt the magnetic field more than oxygenated hemoglobin will. And it'll actually cause a decrease in the signal. So when you look at an fMRI image, the higher the signal you have, the more oxygen is in your blood at that point. And so you actually can measure the, the bold signal after these neural events occur that basically tells you how much energy was consumed at that location. Now, it's not perfect. Like, it can't detect changes instantaneously or tell you exactly what kinds of signals are being sent. But even with its limitations, it lets us better understand which brain regions do what. Using fMRI, scientists have been able to identify 180 distinct brain regions. Better understanding the roles of different brain regions means that doctors can use that information to help treat and support patients with neurological disorders or brain injuries. fMRI technology is cool, but both of us wanted more. We wanted to get into the machine and see what our own brains looked like. Maggie and Steph asked me to participate in a pilot research study looking at how humans distinguish between faces, and I jumped at the chance to help out. I didn't participate in the study, but I was able to get a structural scan. It doesn't measure blood flow, but it does give you a high resolution image of your brain's anatomy. It was a strange experience being inside. It felt like being in a plastic coffin. I can see why some people get claustrophobic. And participating in the study was harder than I expected. Mm. While the task I was doing was easy, it was hard to stay focused on doing the same thing over and over for almost two hours. Mm. But it was also really cool to see the results. And yet, we could not pass up on the opportunity of a lifetime. I mean, sure, it's cool to see your brain on a screen, but imagine holding it in your hands. What does my own unique brain really look like? Well, as it turns out, we're able to find out. Thanks to modern software, we're able to take the 2D slices of our brains and compose them into a 3D render and print them out. Cue the time lapse. Look at that beautiful brain. Mm -hmm. I really liked how the rainbow filament turned out on yeah, this. Like, it so just turned out really cool. I know, and I really like my glow in the dark print. Mm -hmm. It's like super bright. The grooves are much wider in yours mm -hmm. and like not quite as tightly packed, mm -hmm. whereas mine is like super tightly folded. It's cool that you can see the inside too, like the hippocampus and yeah. all these different brain regions. Obviously I knew that my brain wasn't perfectly symmetrical. Mm -hmm. No one's brain is, but you can really see like very obvious differences. It's really interesting to see like, oh, that's the, like, that's my brain's shape. Right. I didn't really think about that before. Every time someone comes over to our house, they'll be like, did you see my brain? <laughs> Let me show you my brain. Let me show you my brain. <laughs> it's incredible that we have the technology to track the activity of a live human brain. fMRI has pushed neuroscience to new heights and has given us a glimpse into the seat of human consciousness. And only somewhat 
Less incredible is the fact that we can use those same images to build 3D models so we can create a life-size version of our own brains. How funny that just a chunk of squishy cells this big can come up with such incredible tools to help us better understand our minds and ourselves. Huge thanks to Maggie and Steph from the Sorensis Lab for their expertise, and to UCSD for giving us access to their scanner. And thanks to Tom for giving nerds like us the chance to share our brainy love. Maybe we'll see you later? Maybe. Until next time, we're Neurotransmissions. Over and out. Thank you folks, go subscribe to Neurotransmissions. I would recommend starting with Micah's video on training a cat to high five, or Ali's video on how marijuana affects your brain. And that's it. I'm back next week and I will see you then.